So welcome everyone. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to one of our workplace mental health specialists from the US, Laurie Van. Laurie is a licensed professional counselor and supervisor of other counselors in Texas. And the reason we have her with us and why we're speaking with her today is because she has a particular expertise in the area of self-injury, also known as self-harm, which we know unfortunately is a growing issue and something that we feel really needs to be much better understood and addressed. So she has written a fantastic book, A Caregiver's Guide to Self-Injury, which shows family members and others how to support their loved one who's dealing with self-injury. So really pleased to see you again, Laurie. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to get to speak with you again. Wonderful. So let's start from the very beginning. What are we talking about when we say self-harm or self-injury? Because that's something that we get asked a lot in our training courses. You know, what is it exactly? Are we talking about cutting or, or what is it? it? It is that. I like to keep it simple because there are many definitions out there. But the one that I've developed over the 20 years is that it's the intentional infliction of harm on one's body, usually for emotional reasons. And so the really mm -hmm. key piece here is the intentional aspect. It's not an accident. It's not, oh, oops, I goofed. I mean, it's a conscious decision of, I know I'm about to create harm on my body. Right, right. And so another question we often get is around what's the relationship with suicide? Does it, does it mean that the person is necessarily, necessarily intending to end their life or how does that work? What's the relationship? It, it's a great question because that is a really important thing to differentiate. So while self-injury is not a suicide attempt, there's a very strong correlation between the two uh, to the matter of fact of at least 60, maybe even up to 70% of people that self-harm do have some type of suicidal ideation. And over the years, I've tracked over 530 individuals. So I, that's one of the things I look at. And I will tell you, yes, at least 60% either, either had the ideation or they've actually attempted. But to right. just reinforce it, the behavior itself does not mean it's an intent or attempt. That's where you have to ask the uh, intent question. Mm -hmm. So what was your aim in doing this? So, and why do people do it? I think that's something that for people that are not in that space, it's, it's very difficult to understand. Um, why do people, you know, want to hurt themselves? You said there was emotional reasons? Usually, yes. So in a caregiver's guide to self-injury, I chronicle uh, over 30 different reasons. And since I've written that mm -hmm. book, I've come across several more. So I'd say there's at least 35 mm -hmm. different reasons I've charted. And the most common, I mean, by far the okay. number mm -hmm. one reason is that yeah. the emotional yeah. pain is so bad. It's just so difficult to deal with. It's easier to deal with the physical pain. It's, it's cathartic. Mm -hmm. It's a release. Right. It's a distraction. It's a way to ground themselves. Uh, but I mean, we can go into my other, I guess you'd say top tens. Sure, sure. But it's interesting because what we're seeing is it's a way of trying to cope with or manage other stuff that's going on, all the other emotions, whatever they may be for the person, right? So yes, it serves a purpose in a sense, yeah. It absolutely does serve the, a purpose. So some individuals, when they get really emotional, they're upset, they're just looking for some release, they might grab a bottle or they might mm -hmm, grab mm -hmm. some, they might grab a joint or yeah. they might gamble or lose themselves on a video game. The thing is, is that our society likes to pick and choose, you know, which mm -hmm. behaviors it keeps upset about. Yeah. And we, for lack of a better way to put it, it's almost like we normalize, rationalize, we're okay with the substance end of it. And even the eating disorders has become more accepted in right. a way. But self-injury is so taboo. It's like, oh my God. It is. Yeah. Like, oh, 
And that's why it's so much more prevalent than what people believe it to be is because mm-hmm. people are so shamed by the behavior. Why on earth yeah. would they ever disclose that that's what they're doing? Yeah. Yeah. It is so and, much and more I, common. And, and I, uh, more common than we think or more common than those other coping strategies. It's definitely much more common than we think. And one statistic that applies in America, at least, is, and I've seen it over the course of three years, the same stat has been consistent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's one in four girls in high school. High school for America is age 14 to 18. So one in four high school girls have self-harmed. 25% right there. And then I can tell you the teenage boys are doing it too. Right, right. And that's one of the adults. I was going to say, that's one of the things we have this sort of stereotype image that it does tend to be younger people and it tends to be more females. Is that correct? Or, you know, is is there other people that are using this coping strategy as well? Definitely other age groups are. It Mm -hmm. starts in elementary school. A lot of people are shocked by that. They're like, oh my gosh. That's scary. Absolutely. I would say a good number of Mm -hmm. individuals, if you find themselves farming as teenagers, they probably start in elementary school and age 10 is one of the most common ages I'm coming across. Wow. Now they're not jumping right into cutting, but Mm -hmm. they're doing other things, the scratching and the picking and the hitting and maybe the pinching or the rubbing, all those things that are easier to not catch as forms of self-harm, but they actually are. Yes. They really are. And then it's just over the course of time, that's when they move up into cutting and burning. And then people are like, oh, they just started to do this. And it's like, no, they've been doing this for two or three years. Mm -hmm. You just found Mm -hmm. out now. And adults self-harm too. Right, right. And are there differences in the presentations that you would see between younger people and adults? For younger people, especially once they get into the teen years, you do tend to see more of the cutting, carving. You can see the scratching. Uh, Burning does occur. Burning is its own very interesting piece of self-injury because if you burn, you're really looking for that pain piece, but it also is if they are consistently or they've done burning several times, they want the radiating pain because with a cut, mm-hmm. it's sort of a over and done with, so to speak. I mean, yeah, there still might be some throbbing, but a burn that's going to last for days. And that's where right. oftentimes people might do it once and they go, Oh, okay. Yeah. That's not going to be my method for adults. Mm-hmm. I, I had an a individual, a male in his fifties that the right. first time he ever self-harmed was in his and he wow. did it with cigarette burns. Right, right. And and it sounds like you're, you're saying there's this sort of escalation and similar, would you characterize it as an ad- addiction in, in the way that it sort of escalates over time? Absolutely. People need more to get that response. It, it absolutely is. The second book I wrote, A Practitioner's Guide to the mm-hmm. Treatment of Self-Injury, right spend one of the biggest chapters of the book is the question of is self-injury and addiction and i make the case that yes it absolutely is the mm-hmm. neurotransmitters that are affected the brain's chemicals yeah. are ex- similar to what you see with substance addiction mm-hmm. or substance mm-hmm. misuse uh, mm-hmm. you look into the whole cycle of it. it it's very ocd in nature which you can make the argument ocd is like an addiction itself because you have the urge and you're anticipating and maybe you're fantasizing and then you mm-hmm. finally do the act, you have relief and then it starts all over again. again. Yeah, yeah. So at the WMHI, at the Institute, obviously our focus is on workplaces and uh, why should a company be concerned about this when it comes to their employees? It's a great question. So one, most businesses have some employees that are probably engaging in this behavior, Mm -hmm. but they just don't know. And that can place a business at a risk because as we said, self-injury has that correlation with suicide. 
Now you might have an employee that attempts suicide and you go, oh, well, where'd that come from? Well, it's because maybe the origins are back there. Mm -hmm. Substance, uh, substance misuse in the workplace. We know that that happens. We know that there are employees that are not using substances the way they should. uh, And that there is a correlation with self-injury and substance misuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also know eating disorders and that. So when when you look at the statistics for those other behaviors that we give more attention to, you have to acknowledge that self-injury is right there with it. So you can't really just do the one and not the other. And if nothing else, I guarantee that your employees have Mm -hmm. family members that have been engaging in this. Yeah, well, when you're talking about those kinds of numbers, I mean, we we often talk with workplaces and many will um, be quite proud of the fact that, you know, well, we we don't have any of that here. You know, everyone's happy here and and bless them. It's great that they want that so badly, but just purely statistically speaking, it and and it's not blaming anybody. It's just as as a matter of statistics, there's going to be people and we don't always spot it. So what could we be looking out for what signs might we see as a colleague, um, you know, or or as a parent or a friend? How would we know, especially with uh, so many people working from home these days, you know, we don't have that in-person contact as much as perhaps previously. Um, What can we do to be aware? That is the really great struggle right now with working from home or for Mm -hmm. students doing school for home yeah. online learning. Yeah. Uh, that has been one of the major concerns that has yeah. come up because of all the quarantine is that people yeah. one are just more isolated. So that in mm-hmm. itself increased risk, not just for self-injury, but for depression, anxiety. We know yeah. that's just through the roof. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I think when you see some of the changing in in clothes. Now, right now it's winter up in Mm -hmm. our hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So long sleeves, not going to be too surprising, but when it gets to be spring and summer and someone's still wearing long sleeves and they really make this conscious decision. And you know, that's not typically been their fashion since you might go, well, that's Mm -hmm. interesting. It's not necessarily saying that's what they're doing, but that's, it's one piece of it. You do look for the shift in the mood. I mean, just depression and or anxiety. Mm -hmm. This is a unique part. People don't often think about perfectionism and self-injury correlation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Because I think that's really interesting and something that, as you said, we we often don't notice. It's perfectionism is seen as a a really good attribute to have in a lot of ways. You know, we go to a a job interview and what's your weakness? Oh, I'm a perfectionist. You know, <laughs> it, oh, it, it oops, means more so than that, yeah. though. <laughs> you know, it does mean uh, more than that. There's a really dark side to perfectionism. Absolutely, and I had started to actually write two books on perfectionism. One that's mm-hmm. going to be geared more for students, and one that's actually geared for adults because yeah, I filled out so many short-term disability claims before adults that were perfectionists and they just got to the point where they could not perform anymore. The demands were yeah. too high. Uh, yeah. They really yeah. inadvertently sabotaged themselves. But with self-injury and that perfectionism piece, it mm. oftentimes you have people pleasing as the other component. So individuals that are perfectionists sometimes really struggle with people pleasing, which means mm-hmm. boundary setting mm-hmm. issues. Those that self-harm often, quite often, tend to be people pleasers. They're not really good with setting boundaries. So you have this group that is very worried what other people think about them and making that good impression. And so for a perfectionist, when they don't live up to that mark, when it, whether it's their standard or someone else makes a comment, oftentimes they internalize that. Mm-hmm. And you can only stuff, stuff, stuff so long before there has got to be an outlet. And that might be that they go to explode and they get drunk. Or mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. they're the people pleaser, they're going to implode upon themselves. And that yeah. can take the form of self-harm or eating disorder for that matter. 
Mm-hmm. And that, you know, you mentioned you had 30 plus reasons why people would do it that sort of, is it a punishment? Is it a guilt thing or either or or both? It sounds like every person has a very unique sort of pattern of how they do stress, anxiety, perfectionism, depression, and then how they try and manage those feelings and emotions as well, even within the category, if you like, the mental health category of self-injury there's going to be so many different individuals with a different Mm -hmm. story, so to speak. Would that be right? Yes. One of the things when I'm doing assessments and I'm training other professionals in how to do a proper assessment of this behavior is that I remind them every time someone self harms could be for a completely different reason. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. oftentimes when they self harm or self injure, you might have multiple reasons. It's not just I was sad or I was angry. It could be yeah. I was angry and I was hurt and disappointed and I was really, you know, stressed out because things weren't going my way. Mm-hmm. So it could be multiple things for a single episode. Mm-hmm. So we have to be very careful about not making those assumptions of, well, people that yeah. injure, they must just all be depressed. That's that's not the case at all. Or, or unfortunately, one of the ones that we still hear from time to time, are they seeking attention? That's, yeah. I think, one of the trickiest ones because there it adds that sort of layer of judgment on top of the distress the person's already experiencing. And as we said, the taboo and the perhaps shame that they may have around this as well. So we've got to be really careful um, not to go down that path either. Absolutely. And in different training events, I go in and explained, yeah. you can't make that statement. You cannot make the assumption they're attention seeking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the thing that I put out there is that one, are there some people that show off their wounds and are like, oh, look what I did this weekend and they want attention? Absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. But I will tell you the vast majority of those that self-harm are keeping it under wraps and people don't Mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. It's a very secretive Mm -hmm. and probably shame-filled behavior for many individuals. Mm -hmm. But I would also add a little bit of a compassion piece to it. Because the thing is, if someone has to go to that level to get attention, how sad is that? I mean, really, what a desperate cry to help. They feel like They've exhausted the other options and they have to go to this level to get Mm -hmm. someone to pay attention. I don't know, to me, that seems worthy of like, wow, more understanding (laughs) and judgment. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we say in the training. If someone's going to that depth to get attention, then clearly there's some attention needed here. Yes. So, so what do we do? How do we, if we do observe something amongst someone we know, we, we see some of these pieces of the puzzle possible warning signs because we can't assume you know as you said with mm-hmm. just because someone's wearing long sleeves maybe they liked the top um we can't jump assume but if we do start to see a few things that we think oh something's not right here i've got a bit of a, a concern what can we do what would be the best way to approach it as a first step being well, non-clinicians and- non-professionals well in a workplace setting yeah. it's one just start to get to know the person you don't mm-hmm. even have to say hey are you doing this yeah I noticed that you're wearing a lot of bandages or you spend a long yeah. time in the bathroom it's no don't be a detective but mm-hmm. anytime you see a coworker and it just seems like they're stressed out or they're anxious or they're sad or depressed mm-hmm. just go be a friend don't mm-hmm. ask them 20 questions just be present just say, you know what, I'm going to go down and get a coffee. Do you want one? It's just the simple gestures are such a great starting point. You're not responsible for solving their problems and making it all better. A lot of times just having someone that gives them a smile that just says, no, genuinely, like, how are you doing? that can be the catalyst for change for them. That literally small gestures like that can Mm -hmm. change the direction of going, you know what, I was thinking about doing this behavior, but maybe there's a little bit of hope out there. Maybe someone actually does. Yeah. 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 
So in your experience, do people necessarily need to get professional help if this is something that they're struggling with or someone they know is? Yes. So one thing that comes yeah. up from the parent side that I've heard, and, and I think I've even heard professionals say this, is that, well, why don't they just grow out of it? Isn't it just a phase? And they reference that a lot in regards to minors. But the problem is, again, we have adults that do this. And out of my numbers, at least 10% started after the age of 18. And I have plenty of individuals that were in their 30s and above that were wow. self-harming. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I don't think it's a grow out of it stage when you're in that stage of life. So one, you, you can't make that assumption. Now, are there some people that might try for a while and they go, you know, this isn't really my thing and they move on to something else? Sure. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is if you've not worked on that core issue, that root system, exactly. you're just going to flip flop to most likely another unhealthy behavior. Exactly. You've got to deal with whatever is the stressor underneath. And now, you know, particularly in the world at the moment, we've seen, as you were saying, mental health uh, levels skyrocket. There's a lot, a lot of stress, a lot of change, a lot of challenges for people at the moment. So, you know, even, and one of the things I say to people is if they are reaching out for professional help, they don't necessarily need to express absolutely everything the first time they meet with a professional either. You know, sometimes it's okay to, to take it a little piece at a time and, and look for some help with the stress that might be going on or with the perfectionism or with anxiety and you know, build up some trust with someone until you feel comfortable to share more of what's going on for you. But do, yeah. do, people, yeah. do you think people struggle to, to reach out for professional help, particularly in this area? I do. I had for a while a women's non-suicidal self-injury support group and I would have women call up expressing interest in and just the shame they're like i can't believe i'm having to make this phone call this is so embarrassing this is something yeah. that teenagers do i'm like no the i started mm -hmm. the group because i had enough women contacting me saying what mm -hmm. about us yeah. and yeah. men definitely do as well but there's barriers for men getting assistance mm -hmm. because it's you know you're supposed to be able to do it all on your own and you know yeah. be tough and and truly, I mean, as we know in, in the field that one of the bravest, one of the smartest things that you can do is get help. Yeah. I mean, it's truly yeah. one of the strongest things and bravest things that you can do, but absolutely one of the wisest decisions that you yeah. can make. Because if you think about in the coaching piece, if you don't know how to play golf, you get a coach. Well, in life, you're not given an instruction manual of this is how you deal mm -hmm. with the layoff. This is how yeah. you deal psychologically with the pandemic. I have yet to see an instruction manual that we were all given of this is <laughs> the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 2020 or 2021. Um, yeah. And, and I, I think one of the best things that I see people get is just a sense of relief when someone's able to say to them, <laughs> you're not the only one, you won't believe it, but so many people are struggling with the same thing and you're not crazy and we can start from here to improve things. You know, just that having that sense of relief that, all right, um, yeah, it's okay, it, it, I can start from here. It absolutely is. And that's one of the benefits of support groups. And I have the one for teenage girls and I, I put under a coaching guy. So that way it's not limited to just yeah. the counseling license. It's literally anyone in the world could join that group. But the support factor is so big of mm -hmm. in a group, you go, I'm really not alone. Like there are mm -hmm. other people dealing with this yes. and it puts things in perspective. And there's so many benefits to groups and it's not that people have to share their life story in a group. Mm -hmm. Most, if they're run correctly, are very respectful of that. There are group rules, confidentiality, that 
Yeah, if you're not feel if you're not comfortable talking, then you know what? It's okay. You don't have to. You can just sit and be present and listen to others until you feel that comfort level. Mm -hmm. And counseling or or coaching, either way, it's not to go back to your point. You don't have to give your entire life story in that first visit. One of the things I do at the intake is say, "Hey, I know this is awkward." You're coming to a complete stranger. You know nothing about mm-hmm. me other than what you saw on my website. Yes. And so yeah. if there's anything that we start to talk about today that you're not comfortable with, it's okay. Just let me know. And you know what? We'll get back to it later. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So it's, it, it's not as intimidating of a process as what people think it is. One of the things that's really stood out to me from what you've said is that that 10-year-old <laughs> piece and I'm just wondering, like, from a preventative perspective, what can we do as, a, as parents, perhaps teachers, uh, in workplaces? What, what can we do, given that many times it starts young, but not always? How can we prevent people from getting to this space where they see this as, a, as an option for them? Is there anything we can do in our environments? There's a, there's probably several things on the parenting side, it's quality time together. It's being present. Mm -hmm. It's putting down the technology. It's turning off the videos and have actual quality engagement with your child because jobs are always going to be there. Mm -hmm. It, It, you know, in some form or another, there's always going to be some kind of job, but your child is only in your house for a certain period of time and you can't ever get that back. So quality Mm -hmm. engagement, making eye contact with them and just even within adults, we've, we got so used to looking down our screen and we're having these conversations and one that's disrespectful, you know, frankly, but Mm -hmm. I mean, we connect when you actually make eye contact with someone you touch them at a deeper level it's more meaningful there's a respect there's a level of care there's I actually care enough to hear what you're saying and to give you that undivided attention Hmm. the one of the big reasons that people do fall into self-harm or I could say you know eating disorders too and and other things the emotional abuse and bullying falls under that category Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very cruel society we've become very detached in a lot of ways and again it's going back to technology because it's so easy to be a troll on social media and say something hateful because you're not in the room with that person to see and feel their reaction so bullying is a big part and Mm -hmm. if we can have more policies that better monitor that, that say, you know what, in our business, we will not have this culture. And that has to yeah. come from the top all the way down. Absolutely, yeah. And, and there's probably a lot of education that needs to be done on that. Obviously, parents need to be monitoring their children's social media accounts, and they need to be having these mm-hmm. conversations of what's okay and what's not okay. The parents have to be very aware of what they are role modeling as well mm-hmm. and how they're talking about other people because kids are listening. Yeah, absolutely. They're sponges. And so what I'm hearing though is it's very relational. Very, I mean, we, we're social creatures and, and we interact with others as part of our life. We need that. And strengthening those social bonds and those relationships can go such a long way for not just for self-injury, but we know for all sorts of mental health issues, it's just so critical. Um, Yes. It's a big focus at the moment. So it's fantastic work that you're doing, Laurie, and I'm so glad we're able to meet and talk about this and and bring some understanding to this topic that so often is in the shadows. I want to ask you, is there like one sort of most important um, thing that you wished everybody knew when it came to self-injury? one key sort of message that you want to get out there into the world? I I guess the overall thing is that there is help out there. There is hope that you do need to do your due diligence and find out who has true experience in it, of course, but you should do that whenever you seek help of any type. Yes. 
and that it's this is something we can turn the tide on. It doesn't have to be the epidemic that it is. And if we will just start having these conversations, things that we consider taboo, but if we just start to have conversations about our our health, and it's not really just a mental health because mental health is physical health. You know, our, our brain is physical health, but I'm, that's one of the things I do hope if there's any possible good that come from that can come from all of this pandemic mess is we have more of an appreciation of the moment and not taking things for granted. And that includes our relationships with people, but it also is the realization of just how important our mental and physical health is and no longer separating them out. Absolutely, I love it. Thank you so much for your insights. I think there's a lot of people that are going to get a lot of real benefit out of this. Um, uh, to everyone watching, if you do want to know more about this particular topic, there's many things you can do, but uh, I'll give you a couple. Number one, make sure you get a copy of Laurie's book and we'll post the link to that in the comments. Uh, if you're interested to really delve into it and, and upskill yourself in this area, if you're looking for training in that reach out to us and we'll give you all sorts of details of what some of the options are. Um, but again, thank you so much for your time, Laurie, and I look forward to talking more. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Hi, I'm Emmy Golding, Director of Psychology for the Workplace Mental Health Institute. We hope you liked the video. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up. We have more and more videos being released each week. So when you subscribe, you'll get a notification letting you know when a new one's just been published. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and don't miss out on this vital information for yourself, your colleagues and your loved ones.